figure of the madman, the madwoman, is archetypal, a universal figure who takes all sorts of forms that point to a common feature, a common modality of being a human being. The figure of the mad person, the lunatic, the fool. It's presenting us with an inescapable aspect of human nature. And as such, there's something to be gained, perhaps, by considering ourselves in relation to this figure. By asking ourselves in what sense we embody some kind of madness, some kind of disregard of reason and common sense. Joseph Campbell described myth as something that never happened but is always happening and surely the same applies with archetypes. We may never come to completely embody a particular archetype. If we did, then I think we'd be in trouble. Yet those same archetypes are active in all of us to some degree, perhaps, at every moment. So, what is it like when we're mad? One place to look for the answer is in the accounts of people who have experienced periods of psychosis in which they found themselves completely lost from their usual sense of self and everyday experience. Sometimes in these accounts there is a moment, often an indication, that the person concerned is starting to recover. When there's a sudden shift in perception that often seems a bit like waking up from a dream. In the year 1812, Spencer Percival became the only ever British Prime Minister to be assassinated. He had a son, John, on whom, of course, this had a huge effect. And in later life, in the year 1830, when he was 27, he experienced a mental breakdown and was incarcerated in a couple of asylums over a period of about three years. Much against the wishes of his family members, he published an account of his experiences. And there's a short passage from this that I wanted to look at. A couple of very tiny incidents that I think cast some light on what it's like when we're mad and also on what it's like when we wake up from madness. Another day, writes John, old benevolence, that's the name of one of the other inmates, presented me with a fine nettle in white bloom, which he had gathered in a hedge and told me it was a green house plant. The size made me hesitate for a moment, but I saw immediately it was a joke. Then my behaviour in the asylum struck me in its true light. The scales fell from my eyes. I knew that I was looked upon as a child. What, thought I, 
You take me for a child, for a fool, but you do not know what has made me so. On another occasion, whilst amusing myself with the bill hook, and that's a word for a, a kind of pruning knife, an old clergyman came up to me to request me to yield it up to him. I said quietly, no, I like to use it myself. He went up to the keeper and I saw them laughing heartily. I reflected then on what I had spoken and could not help laughing at myself whilst I walked up to him and gave him the bill hook. Both these incidents come from a moment in John Percival's narrative when he's starting to feel and also behave in a far more stable manner. And maybe that explains why he's trusted to walk around with a pruning knife. Instead of accepting that a nettle from a hedge is a house plant, instead of refusing to give up an implement that somebody else has politely asked for. He finds himself catching himself and realising that alternative perspectives and behaviours are possible. And it's as if with that comes a whole dimension that wasn't there before of social relationships. Old Benevolence isn't simply making a statement, he's playing a trick or a joke. And when the clergyman and the asylum keeper start laughing at him, John realises that he's acting like a child, he's taking on the role of a child. But you do not know what has made me so, he thinks. Here's another example from a novel by Antonio White called Beyond the Glass. It's an autobiographical novel set in the 1920s, written in the 1950s. And its heroine is a 22-year-old woman named Clara Batchelor, who spends some months in an asylum after a breakdown precipitated by frustration and oppression in her social and romantic life. There was something odd about the women's faces, Clara tells us, and she's talking about the other inmates. Even though some of them were quite good looking and had powdered cheeks and carefully arranged hair. It was something about their eyes, she decided. They had a sly, shallow look, and they were always straying restlessly, as if looking for something or someone. She wished she could find out what secret they all had in common, and which she seemed unable to share. One afternoon, in the garden, she discovered what it was. Three of them came up to her, looking sly but friendly. One asked with a giggle, Do you want to play croquet, dear? With astonishing confidence, Clara answered, Yes. Come on, we'll have a lovely game. She went with them to a lawn she had not seen before. As soon as she saw the wide, bent hoops, she knew they were the wrong shape. The hoops at Paget's fold were straight and narrow. Someone gave her an old mallet. She said firmly to the woman nearest her, You and I will be partners. Shall we take blue and black? I'd rather be red. All right, we'll take the red and yellow. No, dear, you have blue and I'll have red. I always have red. Up the rebels. In vain, Clara tried to explain the rules of croquet. They had come back with absolute clarity, but it was hopeless. No one could understand. In the end, she left them gaily running about the lawn, 
hitting any ball that they saw and usually all playing at once. Her first thought was Alice in Wonderland. They might as well play with hedgehogs and flamingos. But the next moment it came to her. These women were mad. All those women she saw at mealtimes were mad. No wonder she could make no contact with them. She was imprisoned in a place full of mad people. So once again, here in Clara's account, which Antonia White based very much upon her own personal experience, the transition from madness back to her more usual way of perceiving things comes via an understanding, a realisation. For Clara, memories of her earlier life have started to return. Things like the rules of croquet and memories of Paget's Fold, the house where she would spend her summer holidays. And with that seems to come a sense of structure and rules and conventions. And it's when she finds it impossible to impart the rules of croquet to the women around her that she realises that they're incapable because recognising rules implies that we're aware of an external reality. And then following that once again in a rush, that sense of the conventional social world coming back as she realises her position within this social world. A woman among mad women, a woman who has started to awaken from madness. We've looked at madness so far from the inside, but in the Maasai tarot, which is the oldest tarot design that survives, the figure on the card entitled The Fool perhaps presents us with what madness looks like from the outside. The fool is striding along with a staff and a knapsack tied to a stick, dangling from where he has slung it over his shoulder. And as he walks along, a, a dog is worrying at his rear tearing and biting a hole in his trousers which look in danger of falling off. One of the striking features of this image is how awkward and contorted the figure is. The stick with the knapsack attached. He's holding it in his left hand, but it's slung over his right shoulder, and his face is turned to the right as he walks, and meanwhile he's giving his weight to the staff in his right hand as he moves along. If we take a moment and try that position out for ourselves to see how it feels. It's incredibly awkward, incredibly uncomfortable, that bodily position. The type of clothes he's wearing, the actions of the dog at his rear, the way he's carrying himself. 
all seems designed to maximally hinder his progress. If he's embarking on a journey, as seems to be indicated by the knapsack, then he seems to be going about that in the worst possible way. As if to emphasise this in many other tarot decks, the fool is shown striding along towards a cliff edge, a precipice. He's very likely to fall to his doom if he doesn't wake up to his situation. Sometimes in the water beneath the cliff, a crocodile to emphasize the danger that he's heading towards. A dog worrying and biting at him from behind and ahead of him a crocodile with its open mouth waiting. These animals might be taken to represent unconscious, unthinking impulses, forces that both drive him forwards and betoken his fate, his doom. And in between he makes his way in the most ungainly style on the most ill-begotten journey. Sometimes, in some designs, the fall is shown as actually falling off the cliff. In my opinion, that goes a bit too far. Madness is a state. Human beings can fall into that state, but as the narratives of John Percival and Clara Batchelor and countless others besides demonstrate, it's also a state from which it's possible to emerge through an act of understanding of realisation without madness without the recognition of madness there can be no arrival at that realisation what becomes apparent here is the inextricable link between madness and wisdom. It can almost start to seem as if the purpose of madness is to offer the opportunity of waking up from itself. From this perspective, forms of mental illness, psychological distress and suffering are signals, a way of being in which maybe the soul is attempting to incubate some kind of necessary understanding, realisation awakening. Maybe it's a lot easier for others around us to see how we're hobbling along through life in a awkward, contorted kind of way, heading obliviously in the wrong direction towards nothing good. But to ourselves, in that state of madness, it's like we're in a dream. 
and in a dream, even the most absurd and incongruous things that we would immediately recognise and reject as nonsense if we were awake. Instead, we look on them and tolerate them as if they were perfectly acceptable. How do we awaken from that dream? It would be nice to think that just recognising the dream isn't rational would be enough to end it. But rationality itself can be a kind of madness and very frequently takes that form. So-called rationalist thinkers might sometimes try to persuade us that human beings are like biological robots, that we live in a meaningless universe, where meaning, where reality itself are just kinds of delusions that our minds project onto matter. But it soon becomes obvious that that's a view of the world and a view of life that no human being would genuinely want and in fact that no human being could actually live. The very idea of meaninglessness has a meaning. If there is truly something that could be called meaninglessness, it isn't anything that human beings have access to. And so this supposedly rationalist perspective is as ill-adapted to reality as contorted and as ungainly as any other form of madness or delusion. The fool is maybe unique among the human figures depicted in the tarot, in the sense that he conveys of not really being coincident with himself. There's a sense that something is about to happen to him, something that might even end his existence altogether. And so, in the moment of our seeing him, we're not seeing who he really is or who he's meant to be. The fall is pure potential. In his situation, all it will take is some kind of realisation, some kind of understanding for him to become someone else entirely. It's for this reason, maybe. The lack of a fixed identity that of all the major arcana cards, the fool has no number, or is given the symbol for zero. If we become aware of some kind of expression of madness in our own lives, then the way to awaken into wisdom from the absurdity of that dream is neither rationality nor the doubling down in me 
immediately on any specific solution or fixed identity that we feel we should assume in response. The challenge perhaps is to keep that sense of potentiality in play that sense of the possibility of becoming something other. We're going to need time and space if we're going to find a new kind of identity that can enable us to fit into and connect with the world in a more comfortable, uh, better adapted way. The idea of an asylum is to provide the opportunity for someone who can't deal with the world to take some time away from it and hopefully somehow find the resources whereby they can. This is the challenge we face when we uncover our own madness. Sometimes the course our madness leads us along is towards self-destruction. How can we provide some kind of asylum for ourselves if we're doing things that are harmful Sometimes that just simply has to be stopped before there's any hope of finding some constructive respite from the world. And often, very often, external circumstances will be making demands, requiring that we act in order to keep our self and others safe. This can limit our options and maybe shut down to some extent that sense of potential which the fool in the tarot shows us is essential for self-transformation. Times of crisis are probably less likely to offer opportunities for awakening from madness, but more likely to compound the kinds of constrictions that lead us into it. The anonymous author of Meditations on the Tarot writes, The fool has a double meaning. Indeed, it can be understood in two different ways as a model and as a warning at the same time. For on the one hand it teaches the freedom of transcendental consciousness elevated above the things of this world, and on the other hand it clearly presents a very impressive warning of the peril that this elevation comprises, lack of concern, inadequacy, irresponsibility and ridicule, in a word, madness. Anonymous highlights the double-edged nature of madness here by placing us out of line with reality. It offers the potential of renegotiating that relationship with reality all over again. The possibility of regaining a new identity, a new way of being better connected to reality than the old one, hopefully. Yet, at the same time, being out of line with reality presents obvious dangers and circumstances likely to occasion harm. These can't always be ignored and will have to be dealt with. 
in that case we have to do whatever's necessary to create for ourselves and others as much safety as we can which hopefully might form a basis for that sense of asylum that may be every journey through madness requires.